good people. Mark Holmes here, and as always, with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. I hope everybody's having a great Taco Tuesday. It is another big week for the Dallas Cowboys because Friday and Saturday we have the rookie mini camps. We also have, of course, on Thursday the schedule release. Uh, so we'll be doing a live stream there uh, during case of, well, here's the thing. What you're going to get is you're going to get leaks all day long about what who the Cowboys are playing, where and when and all this stuff. So by the time the show actually goes off, the schedule will already be released, but that's the way that it actually goes. The NFL, of course, is about basically publicity. They want as much as possible. And so here we go today. Well, typically what we hear from everybody is Jerry Jones, Stephen Jones are just being cheap. We heard yesterday, of course, that there's been no movement basically on the Dak Prescott contract situation or C.D. Lamb, who is actually holding out. But here's the thing that I will say is a great thing is that we're not seeing animosity between the two sides. This isn't getting ugly. We've seen it get ugly before with Demarcus Lawrence and the Cowboys where Demarcus Lawrence basically said, screw you, I am not going to get my shoulder worked on until I get a contract. Dak Prescott is going about business and basically saying, that's my, my agent's job, he'll take care of it. C.D. Lamb, um, we don't know when or where that contract is going to be done, uh, much less which will be done first, Dak Prescott or C.D. Lamb. Some people believe that Dak Prescott's contract will be worked on before C.D. Lamb's. But the reality is, is the Cowboys let us know early on that it would be later, as in training camp. Uh, the good news is we are knee-deep in May right now. The first week of May is almost in the books, and I can't believe it that next week, wow, <clears throat> next week, I just got back from the draft last week, and I'll be headed to Vermont for, uh, I think, nine days where we're going to be doing uh, volunteers. We'll be uh, working on helping to get people moved back into their homes and things, so that'll be a great trip giving back. So... Right now, there's not much of anything going on other than the whole sea of Najee Harris. We had heard Najee Harris, who was basically going through and talking about, you know, Dak Prescott and, you know, that he's a good quarterback and that, you know, 12 wins is not enough. And he's looking at the way his quarterback situation has been. And there's some thought because. The Steelers declined to keep his fifth-year option, which would have only paid him only $6.8 million, that they declined to do that, that he will be a free agent unless they tag him um, after the season coming up. Now, the Steelers haven't ruled out getting a deal done with him for the long term. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Now, of course, the Cowboys. People will look at it and say, well, you've got Zeke Elliott, who has been declining for years, and when he was great, she didn't win a Super Bowl with him then. Um, <clears throat> he's more of a situational player, a uh, pass blocker for Dak, of course, and helping with, uh, will be helping, of course, chipping on his way out in coverage, and a short yardage back, but he may not be the lead back, and that the Cowboys should be getting somebody else. So the dots were connected that the Cowboys, of course, would have interest. And we know that no matter who it is out there, if you write an article and you want to get some traction, all you have to do is say, linked to the Dallas Cowboys. And that's exactly what happened on that one. But then again, it could be that there is deflection. Um, Jane Slater, because everybody went through and was talking about Najee Harris, the Cowboys got interest in everything else, and you know everybody is following along on that and talking about the possibilities and so forth. And then Jane Slater poo-pooed the idea because she said the people she's talked to in the organization say that's just basically a clickbait story, that, that's, that there's nothing to that. Although, the cynical side of me would say is, would the Cowboys actually say to Jane Slater, knowing that she is the media, yeah, we want to go trade for that guy and drive up the price?
You follow what I'm saying here? I'm, I'm okay. Listen, we're just putting out all sides of the equation. I mean, you'll remember. Hmm. You remember before Russell Wilson was traded? <clears throat> Russell Wilson said, "I want to finish my career here for the team that drafted me." And Pete Carroll literally said, "We're not trading Russell Wilson." No, he's our quarterback. And lo and behold, the next week he was gone to Denver. Just saying. If you're going through and you're buying a car and you tell the car dealer, hey, my other car just broke down. I got to have a car for tomorrow. I got to go to work. Do you think that the dealership is going to work out a nice deal because he's got sympathy for you? No. He knows he's got your ass. And he's going to want to make the most out of this sale. He's going to take you for every cent because he knows you're desperate. So I'm not saying that the Cowboys have interest in trading for Najee Harris. I'm just putting it out there that if you are, the last thing you're going to say is, yes, we're trying to trade for Najee Harris. Pass it on, Jane. Pass it on. Anyway, there's not a whole lot going on today. Today's going to be kind of a quiet day. Um, I've got some things I'm going to handle this morning, but I, I want to play this again because <clears throat> we have so many people who look and they'd say, we can't win with the players that we have and we just need to get rid of them and start all over. And that's easier said than done. That really is easier said than done. Okay. And, you know, most of us are Joe the fan or people who haven't been there. Before you go ahead and you kill somebody like Micah Parsons and say he's worthless, maybe you ought to talk to a couple of Hall of Famers and get their opinion on Micah Parsons. Off to a trip to Asia, Micah Parsons has been all in this offseason. On the field, it's the same approach. Parsons just one of three players since sacks became official in 1982 with 40 sacks and 200 tackles in his first three seasons. Look at the list he joins. Hall of Famers and the late great ones. Reggie White and Derek Thomas. Not many people can wreck the game like Micah. How would you define what a game wrecker is? A game wrecker is a person, the offenses put that circle around you and saying, this is a guy that we have to stop. Back to throw, look at, oh, he's chased. Parsons has got him again. You have to take over the game. You have to make people fear what you are. When I say the name Micah Parsons, what's the first word or thought that comes to your mind? Girl, the brother can run. Parsons coming! Parsons coming! brother can run. He can put one foot in front of the other. They put fear in your heart. Flushed out by Parsons, sacked by Parsons. He has to work on a couple other things. Such as? His inside move and his power move. But let me tell you, when he turns that corner and that offensive tackle start leaning, he throws them across like, like um, um, a sack of potatoes. I'm amazed uh, with some of the moves he makes. Let's go! It's almost like if you got a rubber band and you sort of pulled it back as far as you can, like a bow and arrow, and you just let it go. He did that every play. Is there a play that comes to mind that really defines Micah Parsons as a game wrecker? One play that I saw with Micah, he goes underneath, runs right into the guard, and he beats the guard. And then there's a running back right there. And so he ends up beating the running back and gets a sack. He's hit! He's sacked by Parsons! Mm. He lines up inside of a guard, and before they can blink, he's through the hole. And that's what LT did. Yeah, you mind. You mind, baby. And I still don't understand how they can just line up, and before they blink an eye, they throw. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. I'll take you back to Bill Parcells, and I heard Lawrence Taylor stories every day about how to play, how to play with a tenacity. We always said, turn up the radio and make it as loud as possible. And 
That's what Lawrence Taylor did. With Micah, he has all the tools. The tools of the Lawrence Taylor are neck to get to the quarterback. If Micah can be consistent this whole year, mm -hmm. that's when he gets that Lawrence Taylor factor. Pressure. Good night, Nurse Parsons. No, what? what are they talking about? Get that. Without a doubt, there was no question. Lawrence Taylor changed the way that that position was played. How has Micah Parsons done that for this generation? He's set by Parsons. Teams are trying to draft players like Micah that can play outside, inside, right or left. And so that means that he's already changed the game. The only thing he has to do to seal his legacy is win a Super Bowl. If he can win a Super Bowl, let me tell you, untouchable. Untouchable. Wow. Ooh. When those two legends talk about uh, Micah Parsons and they bring up Lawrence Taylor, my goodness, back here with Mina as well as Sam. Acho, now you just heard them use the word untouchable. If Parsons wins a Super Bowl ring, do you agree with that statement? Not yet. Uh, not yet. The reason why is I go towards, number one, the longevity of what it looks like. You look at a guy like DeMarcus Ware, 12-year NFL career, nine in Dallas, three in Denver, and a Super Bowl. I think about the place he was able to make, right, over an extended period of time, and also in the playoffs, too, right? Like, Michael Parsons has shown up in the regular season year after year after year, now start doing it in the playoffs, and maybe that's what they're talking about. Man, you... You'd be the reason why your team wins. Think about Von Miller good, when he was with the Broncos and him taking that ball from Cam Newton in the Super Bowl. Plays like that are the plays you remember. And so all those things are elite and electric. I want to see it over a long period of time, a sustained period of time, but also in the postseason when it matters most. Mina, you know, we see the graphic with the impact in the regular season as well as the postseason. Micah is great in the regular season, but what concerns do you have for the rest of this Cowboys defense? Yeah. Well, last year, they were dominant, not just Parsons, but as a whole, the unit was dominant during the regular season. Then you saw some cracks as the year went on, culminating in the disappointment in the playoffs, uh, which can be attributed to a few things, but mm -hmm. all boiled down to the simplest reason. They ran out of linebackers, Kevin. Thank you! Uh, they were playing, you know, a lot of safe uh, dime, so putting three safeties out there, doing whatever they could to uh, account for the injuries that they had at the second level, but it wasn't enough. So their big signing this offseason, really their only signing in free agency of note, uh, was bringing in Eric Kendricks, reuniting him with their new defensive coordinator, Mike Zimmer. I thought that was a good move, but I question whether it's enough, given the issues that they had with depth there. Uh, in the draft, you know, in the first round, they go offensive line. Second round, they take a pass rusher, which was not an area of need for them. And while the Cowboys have drafted very well, uh, so I'm kind of reluctant to question some of their choices. I do question whether or not we might see this same issue with them again, stopping the run, going up against teams that put lots of tight ends on the field, like what Buffalo did to them also at the end of the season. I think that could be an issue as much talent as they have on that defensive line. You mentioned a phrase, is it enough? And Cowboy fans have been asking that. The Cowboys are ranked last in free agency <laughs> yeah. spending this year. Just $13 million committed to free agents. That is yeah, $19 but that's million dollars less than the next lowest team, the Saints of wow. $32 million. My goodness. And saying, this is a guy that we... There we go. Yes, that's true. The Cowboys ranking last in free agency spending. But guess what? The Cowboys have always ranked last in free agency spending. And these teams that they're talking about that have spent a lot more, lost a lot more games than the Cowboys. Let's be clear here. We've seen New Orleans spend buku money over and over and over again, and New Orleans is nowhere further than we are. And they had a Hall of Fame quarterback. Seriously. We've seen Washington spend a boatload every year. And... What do we see from the commanders? Nothing but the left hand up. So spending money doesn't always equate with uh, success. Now, I would love to see them spend some more money. I think the thing with Micah Parsons is, you know, when they talk about the legacy of Von Miller and what he did, in, of course, in the Super Bowl with Cam Newton, they failed to mention that he also had DeMarcus Ware on the other side. 
as well as when he played for the Rams and you had Aaron Donald in the middle. Um, and even when you think about Lawrence Taylor, who of course had like Carl Banks and incredible players around him as well. That's what the Cowboys need to do. In the same way I say that you look at Dak Prescott, you, you need to surround him with weapons. You need to make sure that they have multiple people that they can throw to because then people are open. Then you hit the open man. It's easier than if you're constantly trying to throw into tight windows. If Micah Parsons, who is an incredible force rushing the passer, he's not the run stopper. You need to have that defensive line. And that's the area I look at right now and hope that the Cowboys would do something and maybe bring in a guy like a Calais Campbell or some other defensive lineman to help that run support. They've done some good things as far as the draft goes, as well as um, bringing Eric Kendricks. They've been trying to address the situation where we're not going to be putting safeties in at linebacker and that we are, instead of going through with the whole position flex where, you know, our safeties are linebackers and so forth and our tackles are our nose tackles and things like that, they're looking at and saying, you are an edge rusher. That's what I need you for. You are a defensive tackle. Mozzie, you're a one technique, and that's what you are, as opposed to trying to get these guys to be multiple positions. When you're jack of all trades, you've got experience in all of them, but sometimes you need a master at a position. All right, good people, as always, I appreciate each and every one of you guys, and um, I'll be seeing you, of course, soon because, you know, I'm constantly doing videos. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Lincoln Mercury. Nobody has four kinds of cars or four kinds of people. See them at the sign of the cat. By Goodyear, makers of the custom steel guard radial tire. And by State Farm Mutual. Almost anywhere you live, there's a State Farm agent nearby. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there.